Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Wisconsin's Green Fire Conservation Webinar, Coming Down the Pipe, Oil Pipeline Regulations in Wisconsin. Uh, this is the third in our April conservation webinar series, and we're glad that you're finding time to join us this afternoon. My name is Fred Clark, and I'm the executive director of Wisconsin's Green Fire. I'm joined today by our vice president of our board of directors, Jim Perry, and by our panelists, Rob Lee from Midwest Environmental Advocates, Nancy Larson, and Tom Giroux of Wisconsin's Green Fire. For those of you who are Wisconsin's Green Fire members, we're glad that we can provide this opportunity to discuss this important and timely topic of oil pipeline regulation in Wisconsin. And for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We appreciate your interest and we hope that you find this program valuable um, and that you'll be interested in learning more about our work. Wisconsin's Green Fire supports the conservation legacy of Wisconsin by promoting science-based management of natural resources. We're one of Wisconsin's strongest voices for science and conservation. Our members work throughout Wisconsin on issues including wildlife, fisheries, water resources, forests, farms, and working lands, as well as the science of climate change and our path to renewable energy. I encourage you to learn more about Wisconsin's Green Fire at our website, wigreenfire.org, and follow us on social media. Now, for those of you in our audience, let me just point out a couple of the features uh, at your controls. Um, depending on the type of device you're on, most of you will see a screen that looks like this. And up in the upper right corner of your screen, you're likely to see a control button that'll give you some viewing options. Uh, you can switch between an active speaker view or a gallery view uh, to see all of our panelists or to uh, simply see the individual speaking. Um, and as well, you'll be able to see the slides that uh, Rob and Nancy and Tom are sharing. We're gonna divide the presentation today into two segments and we'll take questions um, after our first segment on eminent domain. Um, and then following the remainder of the presentation, we'll take a second set of questions uh, with a name to wrap up today at six o'clock. For those of you that wanna submit questions, we invite that and encourage it. And the way to submit a question um, is using the little Q&A box, which you'll see down in the lower uh, control bar of your screen. Um, it's down here on the left side of the bar in this uh, screenshot that you're seeing. You can submit questions through that at any time. And Jim Perry will be moderating questions during the two periods that we break for questions. If you're having any technical issues or want to send other comments about uh, barking dogs, uh, cranes flying overhead, or anything else that you think we should know, um, you can also submit um, a comment to all of us as panelists and hosts using the chat feature that's also uh, one of your controls in the lower control bar. Uh, finally, that we won't be able to see you uh, or hear you, but we are looking for an engaged discussion with, with a good set of questions after the presentations this afternoon. So please, um, please take advantage of that opportunity and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Uh, Jim Perry, anything else you want to add before we introduce our panelists? No, I think you've covered it, Fred. Uh, anybody that wants to actually ask a question, I'll be monitoring them and hopefully we'll be able to get at it. All right, thank you. So today we're joined by uh, two of our members of Wisconsin's Green Fire um, and our uh, guest panelist and partner, Rob Lee, who is an attorney with Mid Midwest Environmental Advocates. Uh, Rob is a graduate of Notre Dame Law School and the University of Arkansas. He clerked at Midwest Environmental Advocates during his time in law school. And he also, also has worked at the, excuse me, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality in Lansing prior to joining MEA in 2018. And, and Rob has, uh, as well as his colleagues at MEA, have been great partners with us at Green Fire um, in understanding this and other complex legal issues. Also with us today, Nancy Larson, who is the Assistant Director for Wisconsin's Green Fire. And Nancy was on the ground floor of uh, the founding of Green Fire. Uh, she was one of our founding members. She retired from the Wisconsin DNR in 2016. Her career involved protecting the water resources throughout Wisconsin and 
Uh, she retired as DNR's Northern Program Water Leader, where she oversaw water permitting on complex projects. Nancy has a master's degree from the University of Minnesota. She lives in Ashland County. And Tom Giroux is another founding member of Wisconsin's Green Fire and also on our board of directors. Uh, Tom graduated from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point with a degree in soil science, which he uses every day in managing one of the most productive gardens in northern Wisconsin. He's also completed graduate level work in hydrogeology. And he retired from Wisconsin DNR in 2013 after 34 years working in water programs. Tom coordinated the water program permitting staff. Um, he was born in the Lake Superior watershed on the banks of the Montreal River. He's our bona fide youper, uh, but he also loves his home state of Wisconsin. So with that, Nancy Larson, I'll, I'll turn it over to you for more background on this project. Thank you, Fred. I wanted to fill you in a little bit more about Green Fire and what's our involvement in pipeline issues and give you a little bit more background on our project with Midwest Environmental Advocates. So as Fred mentioned, Green Fire's mission is to promote science-based management of natural resources in Wisconsin. More succinctly, our trade is information. Our members are regular citizens concerned with conservation, as well as people who spent their careers or are still working in science, natural resource management, and supporting fields. <clears throat> we have a lot of in-house expertise. We have members throughout the state and several of us live near the proposed reroute of Enbridge Line 5 pipeline. Many of our members are involved with other groups concerned or opposed to the pipeline, but Wisconsin's Green Fire as an organization is assuming the role of providing information. Late last fall, a number of us members from up north started meeting to consider if there was a role for Green Fire in the Enbridge Line 5 issue, and if we could fill any information needs for citizens. And because we have members who've worked in environmental regulatory programs that would be pertinent to pipeline construction, we considered putting together information to help citizens understand the, the programs. We found there's citizen guides to pipeline regulations developed for Michigan, but none that we were aware of in Wisconsin. And we learned that Midwest Environmental Advocates was interested in the same thing and had done some initial work. So we joined forces to develop a series of guides to oil pipeline regulation, and they're on your screen. Rob Lee, um, who will be um, giving a lot of the presentation today, is an attorney with Midwest Environmental Advocates, is the main author of the guides. And he brings his legal expertise and that of MEA to bear on their development. And then in Wisconsin's Green Fire, we contribute our knowledge of environmental regulatory programs and our experience in implementing them. The guides are short, they're two pages long, and they're densely packed with information. They're great references for people who want to know what decisions are made by the federal and state government agencies and how citizens can be involved. And although the impetus for this project was the Enbridge Line 5 pipeline reroute, reroute these guides apply to oil pipelines anywhere in the state. So we have three guides so far. A guide to eminent domain and condemnation, a guide to the environmental review process for oil pipeline construction, and a guide to, age, to federal and state agency permits and approval for oil pipeline construction. They're available electronically on our website. You don't need to write down these long URLs because just go to our websites and, and uh, search for pipelines and they'll come up. We're planning a few more guides. Uh, in particular, one on water resource permits and, and probably one for local governments. And if you're interested in helping support this project, please contact us. We'll be looking at some additional fundraising to continue the project as needed. It's important to note that the northern third of Wisconsin is ceded territory. And we recognize that tribal governments and citizens have particular interests legally, culturally, and spiritually and we're, we've been having discussions with Tribal Natural Resource Department staff, uh, staff from the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission and their attorneys about the possibilities for working together and addressing and describing some of these issues in upcoming guides. Uh, Rob Lundberg from Midwest Environmental Advocates is leading, leading those discussions. Today, Rob Lee will start us off with a discussion of eminent domain and condemnation in Wisconsin. He'll talk about this for about 10 minutes and then we'll have 10 minutes of questions on that topic. 
And then Rob will move into the environmental review process, guide number two. And then Tom Giroux will take over with guide number three and talk about water permits. And Rob will follow with an overview of other permits and approval. We'll try to move through this material kind of quickly so we have enough time for questions at the end. And again, these guides would apply to construction in it for any oil pipeline in Wisconsin. We know that Enbridge Line 5 is top of mind for many people. Um, none of us are experts in the proposal for Line 5, but we'd be happy to try to answer your questions about how the regulatory processes would pertain to that project. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Rob Lee. Uh, Fred, you can quit sharing the screen and Rob will share his. Nancy, just one quick note um, for viewers who want to see the full uh, format of the slides that Rob and Nancy and Tom will be showing. If you look at your uh, view options in the upper right, there should be a option that will allow you to select fit to screen or, or full size. So um, take a look at that if you're not seeing the full view. Thanks, Rob. So you should now be able to uh, see uh, my uh, slide show while I'm uh, my presenting here. Um, but good afternoon, everybody. Um, as indicated, my name uh, is Rob Lee, an attorney with Midwest Environmental Advocates. I really want to thank uh, Wisconsin's Green Fire for having me today. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here and talk to you about these issues. Um, you know, in addition, I'm really um, happy that we had the opportunity to partner with them and produce these guys because I do really think that they are useful, not only um, for the immediate purpose, you know, the providing information on the Line 5 reroute, but really for um, providing information um, in regards to pipeline regulation in the state of Wisconsin generally. Um, so to jump uh, right in here, um, I think it's extremely important to recognize from the outset and keep in mind throughout our discussion today, the limits of regulatory authority over oil pipeline construction in the state of Wisconsin. You know, while different state agencies have authority over different aspects of pipeline construction, Wisconsin law does not provide any state agency with the authority to give an overall approval for pipeline construction, to examine and determine the need for pipeline construction, or control, uh, control the route that a pipeline will take. And I'll reemphasize this point um, later on. Uh, but do want to just think it's important to kind of frame our discussion today um, with that in mind. And so moving into um, our discussion of eminent domain and condemnation, again, point out that while no agency has the authority to control the route of a pipeline, that oil companies still need to obtain permanent and temporary property rights in order to get their pipeline from A to B. And uh, these property rights typically come in the form of easements. Now, in many instances, oil companies are simply able to negotiate with landowners and obtain these easements. But that doesn't always go so well. And sometimes landowners aren't interested in having an oil pipeline on their property. So what happens then? Well, at that point, oil companies can apply to the Public Service Commission of Wisconsin to obtain the power of eminent domain and condemn those property rights anyway, uh, so long as they pay just compensation for the right to do so. So to initially qualify uh, for, you know, to even apply uh, for the right of eminent domain, uh, four criteria must be met. And, and those four criteria are that the oil pipeline company uh, must be authorized to do business in the state. It must transmit oil through a pipeline in the state. Uh, it must maintain terminal or product delivery services, uh, facilities, excuse me, in the state. And it must engage in interstate or international commerce in the state. So Enbridge, for example, uh, really quite easily meets these uh, four criteria. Um, but once those four criteria are met, all that is left is for the PSC, the Public Service Commission, to determine that granting the power of eminent domain uh, to the pipeline company is in the public interest. So very importantly, what constitutes the public interest is not defined under state law. 
And even though this public interest test has been around since before line five was initially constructed back in 1953, Wisconsin courts have not had the opportunity to interpret that phrase in the context of the eminent domain law. So this really leaves all sorts of questions unanswered. For example, who is the public exactly? Is it the state of Wisconsin, the Midwest? Is it the entire Great Lakes region, you know, including both Canada and US? Is it, is it all the people of planet Earth? You know, who, who is the public? And, and what are we saying is in their interest? You know, does the, the, the PSC only have to consider the benefits of an oil pipeline? Or is it more like a balancing test where the detriments have to be weighed against those uh, benefits? And does the PSC have to look at alternatives that might achieve the same benefits while, while minimizing detriments? Um, the, all of these are just questions that are, are wholly unanswered. And to, to, to even attempt to answer those, all we have to go on are past PSC public interest determinations. And those are few and far between. So uh, for example, there have really only been two public interest determinations in the last 30 years. Uh, in 2008, the PSC granted the power of eminent domain to Enbridge uh, and finding that the public interest was advanced because um, there would be an increase in capacity to deliver crude oil to Midwestern refineries. And, and from those refineries, Wisconsin obtained uh, much of its refined petroleum products, including gas. Uh, in, in 1993, uh, the PSC also granted the power of eminent domain to Enbridge to avoid the adverse impacts of relocating a pre-existing pipeline and because the oil that was being transmitted fueled commerce throughout the Great Lakes region, including the Midwest and Canada. So you can see why we have some of these questions. Uh, you know, we see the PSC in these examples treating the public in one instance as the state of Wisconsin, right? That there are refined uh, petroleum products being brought back to Wisconsin. But in the 1993 determination, we see them looking at the Great Lake, Lakes region as a whole. Uh, you know, for, for what is in their interest, whatever the public may be, you know, we see the PSC examining the benefits that accrue not necessarily from the, the direct um, activity or, you know, of obtaining eminent domain, but really looking at the necessary consequences of constructing and operating the oil pipeline, namely getting the oil to market and providing it as a, co a co commodity. You know, they're talking about you know, in Wisconsin, providing refined petroleum products or fueling commerce throughout the Great Lakes region. Um, but we also see in those decisions no real meaningful balancing of those benefits against the potential de detriments, um, and actual detriments for that matter. So, so really some, some pretty big questions uh, with that process, you know, um, and, and really does not only what constitutes the public, but what's in the public interest, is it just whatever the PSC says it is? Uh, in a particular instance and therefore can change depending on the application. Um, and, and as a result, is it just entirely committed to their discretion, which means that there are no standards for which a, a court can review that determination? Uh, as it stands right now, um, they, they, with past decisions, they really have exercised broad discretion in determining what is the public interest. And, and that, uh, that phrase, public interest, has yet to be uh, really uh, really interpreted by an authoritative body. Um, so, um, you know, and, and again, I just want to reinforce that part of the amb ambiguity with that is just the fact um, that these determinations happen so rarely. So finally, uh, I want to discuss the procedure the PSC uses to make that determination and identify um, some public input opportunities, places where you can get involved in that decision making process. Uh, so once the PSC issues a public notice that it's going to commence proceedings, so not when, not when uh, the 
application is received, but when they issue a notice that they're going to commence proceedings to make a public interest determination, the public only has 14 days to intervene. And by intervention, I mean becoming a full party to the proceeding, just like the oil company is. Uh, and there are two ways to intervene. Now, one is intervention as of right. And, and to do that, a person must show that their substantial interests may be impacted by the PSC's decision. The, the other uh, way to intervene is through permissive intervention. And that's available for parties whose substantial interest won't be impacted, but whose participation in the proceedings will improve the decision that the PSC ultimately makes. So uh, I do want to point out, though, that uh, intervener compensation uh, may be available to cover the cost of participating in the proceedings. So interveners don't always have to foot the expenses themselves. Now, whether or not any party intervenes in the case is extremely important when it comes to the type of proceeding that will take place and the rights of the public to participate in those proceedings. So when there is an intervention of a party, whether through intervention as a right or permissive intervention, and the interests of, those part, of that party is adverse to the oil pipeline company, then the PSC typically holds what is known as a contested case hearing. And that is a trial type administrative hearing where experts can testify and witnesses can be cross-examined uh, and, and really allows for the full development of the record um, on which PSC will make its decision. Uh, so in addition to the rights of full parties, you know, the oil company and parties that intervene, the general public can still participate in that contested case hearing. Um, so, for example, non-parties have the right to testify at a contested case hearing regarding non-technical personal knowledge or, per, uh, or personal opinion. And non-parties may also be given the opportunity by the PSC to file non-party briefs on the issues presented during the contested case hearing. But when an oil company is the only party to the proceeding, there is much less of an opportunity to develop that record. And uh, there is no contested case hearing. The PSC typically only holds what's called a public informational hearing where it makes a, a broad statement about the application that's before it um, and allows members of the public to make oral statements uh, and to submit written comments. So that is what I have um, for um, the first part of our uh, presentation today. We're gonna move on to the question and answer period on eminent domain and the PSC proceedings themselves. Uh, but right before we do that, I, I will point out that I didn't cover um, just compensation and, and the condemnation proceedings themselves, which occur after the PSC grants the power of eminent domain. And so um, if there are any landowners in attendance that, uh, that have specific questions in those er uh, areas, I'd be ha happy to answer uh, those questions to the best of my abilities. And really will answer, of course, all the, the questions to the best of my ability. So, um, with that, I will turn it over um, to Jim and see if there are any questions. Thanks, Rob. Yes, we have uh, a couple of them. Lisa has asked if there are past public interest determinations that would set legal precedent uh, for future determinations. Uh, so, so the question, as I understand it, are, are there past PSC determinations that would set precedent for future determinations? So the, I think that what we're doing is looking at, there's only been, as I indicated, a couple PSC public interest determinations in the past, in, in the past 30 years. And uh, even the 1993 decision, the record for that is, is relatively scant. In, in 2008, technically, it was two <clears throat> applications um, for a public interest determination for, for essentially the same, uh, the same pipeline construction project. And, and so while they did make two, there were two dockets and two separate determinations, um, it really w was kind of one. Um, and, uh, and so there we do have a much more developed record. The question was really whether or not those set precedent. And I, uh, my answer, the answer to that is no. I, I think the, the PSC has shown the type of proceeding 
um, that it's going to conduct to process public interest uh, determination applications and, and has shown how, how it usually goes about that. But we, what we haven't had is anybody uh, suing the Public Service Commission over a determination that it is made in a court of law. And that is really where we make uh, precedent. And so um, what would have to happen if, if the PSC issued a decision, someone would have to sue them over that decision, get uh, through the circuit court and up to our court of appeals actually for any decision um, to be binding and to really get us a, a binding interpretation of what the public interest means. Very good. Uh, a second question comes from Kat and that is, does the fact that the area uh, is ceded territory and resources subject to treaty rights make any difference in how eminent domain is handled? Um, not really, uh, unfortunately. I, it, there are some uh, prohibitions on the ability to exercise eminent domain. So no, they cannot um, condemn land um, that, uh, like on a reservation, right? Land that is uh, uh, either owned or um, occupied by a tribe and they cannot, uh, they cannot condemn land that say owned by the state or a, or, or a local government for that matter. But just because there are, you know, treaty rights in a, a particular area, um, you know, that, uh, that isn't fall in, that doesn't fall into one of those two categories. I would think that um, they would still be allowed to uh, condemn that property. Now that ca that may go in. That may that is probably that is relevant to the determination of whether or not it's in the public interest and would be evidence towards the, towards that question. But likely wouldn't control um, their decision. Okay. Uh, would it be possible to litigate the ambiguity of public interest? And if so, would that delay any uh, construction of a pipeline while that litigation is in process? Yeah, certainly you would, uh, you could sue after the PSC um, issued a, a public interest determination. Um, part of that, uh, what I was hinting at earlier is, was a question of whether or not this is wholly committed to the discretion of the PSC and essentially whatever they say goes. If that's the case, then there aren't really any standards by which to review it and a, and a court may decline to do so. Um, but we, we, that's just um, one way it could go. Um, that doesn't mean that a judicial review is necessarily precluded. Um, and so a, a court would have to make that decision. They would have to decide, is this entirely committed to discretion or um, are there um, standards by which we can review that decision? Uh, once they, um, you know, make that decision, you can certainly uh, move to uh, have a, an injunction a preliminary injunction that would stay um, the decision uh, and not allow construction to proceed until the litigation concludes and we have a decision by the court. Um, there are um, some standards though that govern a court's ability to grant a preliminary uh, injunction. Uh, for, for example, you have to show that, that you have a likelihood of success on the merits of the case. And that may be difficult to show um, you know, in the context of, of a phrase and a statute that hasn't ever been defined before um, by, you know, by a court of law and has no uh, definition in, in statute. So is it possible? Absolutely. Um, and uh, is it probable? Uh, that kind of depends. Uh, what I will say, though, is depending on the outcome of the case, you can achieve clarity from a, from a court that would establish precedent that can provide clarity later on. So it may be bigger than like the immediate line five issue. And even if you don't get an injunction there, you know, maybe you establish precedent that that's going to govern a future construction of oil pipelines. Okay, uh, here's a couple questions that are related and they, they may be too specific to the Enbridge Line 5. Uh, the question regards how the existing pipeline uh, route was obtained, whether eminent domain was used there, and whether we know uh, a lot or just a little of the proposed pipeline by Enbridge might be, be dependent upon eminent domain 
uh, use? So the, the first question was the original uh, pipeline, the one that's existing right now that goes to the Bad R River Re Reservation, correct? That's correct. Okay, so um, as I indicated uh, earlier, um, this provision in uh, the statute was actually established in 1951. So two years before um, Line 5 was originally um, constructed. And so on the reservation itself, uh, Enbridge actually negotiated uh, easements um, with, with the, the tribe. Easements in some instances which have now expired and, is, and are why the tribe has sued to get uh, Enbridge off the reservation. So in those particular instances, um, eminent domain was not used and would have been inappropriate. Um, I can't say for certain, um, but can guess um, that likely eminent domain was used to obtain uh, the property interests outside of the reservation uh, on either side of it. And, um, and, you know, or at least the threat of eminent domain was used in order to compel landowners to enter in negotiations um, and, and, and uh, grant the pipeline company the easements across their property. Okay, and the, the and you, can you? The second question was how um, was it how eminent domain is going to impact the current route, um, and uh, I think very much that there's a reason that Enbridge has applied to the Public Service Commission right now to uh, obtain the power of eminent domain, and that is because certain landowners uh, along the proposed reroute have refused um, to grant. Uh, and bridge the the you know the the right the property interest necessary um, to build a pipeline on their property, and so um, whether or not they'll be able to use that route to to build a pipeline on those properties very much depends on their ability to obtain eminent domain. Now. If they don't obtain eminent domain, that doesn't mean that they're precluded from this pipeline route. It just means that uh, the landowners have a much larger uh, bargaining position, a much better part bargaining position um, to, for a, and, and may just get more money out of it. Now, other landowners may be adamantly and wholly opposed to the project, which, which could result in at least this route uh, not happening. Okay. I think we now need to move on to the environmental review process, Rob. Sure, yeah, and if there are additional questions, um, we can, uh, on that, uh, we can likely take those at the end. So I'm resharing my screen, and we'll go to the next slide. So what we're uh, moving on uh, to now is the environmental review process. So both state, and federal agencies are required to prepare an environmental impact statement for all major actions that significantly affect the quality of the human environment. But uh, it's important to point out that not all agency uh, actions are minor actions. So for example, the individual permits and approvals for pipeline construction administered by DNR uh, are, are considered minor actions. You know, similarly, the PSC does not consider public interest determinations to be major actions. However, even though each individual permit and approval are considered minor action, DNR still has the discretion to prepare an EIS anyway, particularly when a proposed project like the Line 5 reroute involves multiple department actions. So with respect to line five, DNR has indicated it will be exercising that discretion um, and will require um, the preparation of a full EIS. Um, so all that said, I think uh, again, it's important to recognize that even when DNR does decide to prepare an EIS, there are significant limitations on how an EIS impacts the actual permits and approvals that govern pipeline construction. So an EIS is an informational document only. It does not require an agency to make a particular decision based on the environmental impacts that are identified in that document. 
the, the decisions um, that agencies will make uh, outside of the EIS are based on the specific statutory and regulatory requirements that govern each permit and approval. And so agencies may lack the authority to prevent environmental impacts. They, they in some instances, uh, may be affirmatively required to allow them to happen. Um, and then uh, they may also conclude, have the discretion to conclude that other values outweigh the identified uh, impacts. And so this is directly related to what I said at the very top of uh, our discussion today, which uh, is that Wisconsin law does not provide any state agency with the authority to give approval um, for pipeline construction, determine the need, or control the route. So in other words, uh, while an EIS may address all sorts of issues, it's only those issues that direct impact or that directly impact substantive permitting requirements that, that, that have a chance of impacting, you know, the pipeline construction activities or whether or not the pipeline will be constructed at all. You know, I, I think it's extremely useful for the EIS to be comprehensive and address all of those things, particularly because, you know, agencies aren't infallible and there may be certain environmental issues that do impact permitting decisions that weren't, um, you know, they weren't identified or characterized in that way and that can be brought to their attention. And I also think it helps the public discourse on any particular document. Um, or, or proposed uh, project, excuse me. And so um, there are, there, are, there is a utility of having it be that comprehensive, but we just need to be sure that just because an EIS says that all of these bad things will happen, doesn't mean that, that, that the fact that those bad things will happen can change or empower an agency to make a different decision. And, and again, that goes back to this, this overarching principle that, that no agency has the authority to kind of take a comprehensive view um, of a proposed pipeline construction project and say no. Uh, so we're gonna move here um, and just try to talk in depth a, a little bit about each one of these steps. Here, here are the overall steps um, that go into the environmental review process. And in doing so, um, you'll see I have asterisks here um, that indicate where there's public input opportunities, and, and I'll talk about those a little bit in depth. So the, the first step, of course, is something uh, we discussed on the, the first slide under environmental review is that DNR either has to determine that it must prepare an EIS or exercise its discretion to prepare an EIS. After that, um, what typically happens is that a pipeline company will hire an environmental consultant and they will prepare what's known as an environmental impact report that is usually submitted to DNR along with its other permit application materials. So uh, for line five, Enbridge initially prepared uh, an EIR and submitted that to uh, DNR and the PSC, I believe, back in early February. But about a month later, DNR actually submitted a request for additional information on the water resource permitting aspect of this project, which Tom will get to here shortly. Um, um, but based on that, just a few days ago, three days ago, I believe, uh, Enbridge submitted an updated EIR um, to, D to DNR. So once uh, DNR receives uh, an EIR, uh, it typically, uh, contracts with an environmental consultant to, to help it prepare the EIS. And this is set up in, in a way uh, so that the pipeline company, the applicant, is paying uh, for that consultant, but DNR is controlling what that consultant does. And uh, I haven't had an update in about a month or so, but with respect to the line five reroute, the last I heard DNR was just still in the midst of contract negotiations. Uh, with potential consultants. So uh, after that, uh, and this is our first public input opportunity, uh, DNR typically goes through a public scoping process and they have indicated that they will do so for the Line 5 reroute EIS. Now the purpose of the, the scoping process is to identify the issues that the EIS will address. Uh, and we just sort of went through the fact that um, there, you know, there are issues that are going to directly impact their permitting decisions. And then there's this other category of issues that 
um, while they may not impact those permitting decisions, uh, may be just as important um, for our overall understanding of the project's uh, impact on the environment. And so uh, public input is usually sought uh, during the, the scoping process through a public hearing, uh, public informational hearing, and, and by accepting written comments. You know, they, they do have the ability to pursue uh, other avenues like surveys, uh, you know, mailers and things like that, but typically they just do public hearings and, and, and written comments. So, but this really is an important step that includes the public, gets their input right from the start. Um, now, uh, it's important to kind of identify, you know, at least broadly, what the types of issues that an EIS must address. And, and I won't get into, you know, specific issues that, um, that may need to be addressed with line five, because if I did that, we might be here all night. Um, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the EIS must address the environmental impacts, right? Um, but also must address any adverse environmental impacts that, that can't be avoided. Uh, by the project. It must analyze the alternatives to the proposed project and it must describe the relationship between sort of the long-term uses and impacts on the environment and, and the long-term gains, you know. So, so how are these short-term, you know, uh, fleeting impacts, if, if you will, how, how are those, you know, what, even if they may be significant, how are they going to lead to this like overall enhancement of productivity? Um, and finally, they must examine any irreversible commitments of resources um, that we can't get back if, if the project is approved and moves forward. So um, after that, um, DNR engages in consultation with other agencies who may have authority over different aspects of the project or specific expertise with certain aspects of the project and also um, consults uh, with tribes uh, when, uh, when they will be impacted and when that, when that is necessary. Um, so after that, DNR, you know, consults with other agents, or excuse me, after that, DNR takes all of this information and its consultant and they compile it, right, into what is called a draft EIS. So I want to talk about the types of information that they consider uh, or, or required to consider, and that is usually only the information that it is already available to them. Uh, you, DNR and even at the federal government are really under no duty to go out and conduct some big study, um, you know, and come gain additional information um, with regard to uh, a project. So what they do is they take all that existing information, they, they compile it into this draft EIS. And after that, they issue this draft EIS and they are required to hold a public hearing and comment period on that document. So this is your second opportunity. You know, first we identified the issues and now we're seeing how DNR and their consultant are treating and analyzing those issues. And so this is equally as, uh, equally as important. This may be your opportunity to identify additional information that already exists that DNR didn't consider. And, and that uh, is really relevant, not only to the overall, um, you know, project, but to the specific, you know, permit decisions they have to make. Um, now, importantly, DNR is required to summarize and respond to all of those comments and make changes to the EIS based on those comments, if warranted. And uh, finally, um, after all of this is done, a DNR will issue a final EIS and a determination that it has complied with uh, all legal requirements in preparation of that document. So that's all I have uh, for uh, the environmental review process. I'm going to turn it over to Tom Giroux. Um, and Tom, you just let me know uh, on the slides. Okay, I thought I'd start off by uh, showing the route for line five again. The line we're working on, as Nancy and Rob have said, uh, or the uh, documents we're working on, the guides we're working on, are intended to be used for any pipeline project, but I know most of the people on the call are most interested in this line five. So I thought I'd share a, an overview of it. And uh, Rob already stated, you know, we don't get much choice on the route. Typically when we have, let's say a wetland permit, sometimes we'll say, well, can you adjust the route here or adjust the route there? And unfortunately the, in these situations, uh, we can't do that. There are some things we can do to make it better and we'll talk about some of that. 
uh, but th this is the route we have to deal with. And uh, uh, you can see it's many miles and it's linear and it's like a lot of linear projects. It has a lot of stream crossings. Uh, you want to go to the next slide, Rob? Um, so you can see here there's uh, over uh, 800 wetlands that uh, will be within the route uh, area and uh, you know 58 uh, perennial streams and uh, 72 uh, intermittent streams and so on and so you know that gives you the kind of enormity of the project in terms of the amount of environmental review that has to go into this and the amount of permits um, that will be uh, required and so the last slide Rob so when I uh, shared this slide with my co-presenters, Nancy went, oh my gosh, that's pretty busy, Tom. And I just wanted to share this. This is the crossing of the Bad River, uh, just north of Mellon. And it just shows the complexity of information that's put together for these various permits that are required. Um, and I just wanted people to get a feeling uh, for the amount of work that goes into uh, identifying all the wetlands first and then mapping them and delineating them uh, is a tremendous amount of work. Uh, most of that is done by the consultant for the uh, company, but it's closely reviewed uh, by DNR and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, which brings up uh, the first permits I'd like to talk about the, the group that we call water resources permits uh, and then the first in there is the wetland permits. Uh, we have joint authority or overlapping authorities with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on wetlands. All of it stems from uh, the Clean Water Act and I'll just give you a, a thumb guide of uh, where the DNR has authority and then where the uh, federal uh, agency has the authority. In general, the larger rivers, the more robustly navigable rivers are um, under the federal authorities. And then, um, of course, DNR, the state of Wisconsin has overlapping on those two. But then a lot of the smaller streams that you see on this um, slide, uh, are uh, regulated uh, by the state because of the difference in uh, what is a federally navigable water and what is a state navigable water. I could do a whole program on that or others on the call that have better skills than this might be able to do it. Uh, I don't think we need to get that far into the weeds. The important part is that we have uh, joint authority uh, with the federal government and we work very closely to coordinate the permit reviews on these wetlands. So when they, uh, obviously when you're doing these long linear projects, you have no choice uh, but to uh, trench through these wetlands. That has an impact that requires a permit and then the agencies can put conditions on that permit. The good thing about all the wetland permits is because of the cumulative impacts, they're all individual permits. They're no, no general permits issues. So each individual wetland crossing is reviewed and they determine uh, what needs to be done to uh, restore the wetland and maintain the wetland as the trenching is done. One thing that is a common practice is they use timber mats to place down in the wetland so the equipment doesn't root it up and you uh, minimize the amount of disturbance uh, to the wetland. And then they have requirements to restore the wetland and even in the future monitor it. And that's all through the individual uh, permits for uh, the wetland crossings on uh, the entire pipeline. And there were over 800 wetlands identified uh, in the report. Not all of them will have uh, an impact, but uh, there's a significant amount of work there. Uh, the next permit I'd like to talk about is the actual crossing of the waterways. Um, so I forget whether there were 58 permanent streams that were crossed in the application. 
and uh, then 72 intermittent streams and a handful of uh, ephemeral streams. So uh, each one of those uh, is evaluated again for an individual permit. And uh, what they're looking at on those is uh, making sure that they're protecting the habitat, aquatic habitat, fisheries, and to make sure that there's not an obstruction to navigation. And the pipelines are typically uh, buried into the bed of the stream. And if you can go to the back to the next slide, Rob, on the Bad River. Uh, so I wanted, I picked this one specifically uh, because I wanted to talk about um, these streams and rivers. So the Bad River is what we call an outstanding resource water. And that designation gets it special treatment under the Clean Water Act. And uh, basically, uh, you can have no permanent uh, or temporary discharge uh, to an ORW that would uh, result in degradation of water quality. So on most of these stream crossings where they're crossing an ORW, an outstanding resource water, or an exceptional resource water, which is often trout streams, uh, they are using uh, this directional bore. So they start on uh, the far end of the stream and they have a big rig that bores down underneath the river. There's no equipment in the river and it uh, pops up on the other side and they continue laying the pipeline. And you can see that on the slide, it's the section that's in blue. The rest of the pipeline is in, you know, white and red dots but the section that goes over the Bad River is in blue. And again, that's uh, to protect that outstanding resource water. So those are two, most of the individual permits. And now we're gonna talk just a little bit about some of the general permits uh, that are required. And staying on this slide, I think it's important we're gonna uh, go to the stormwater construction permit. Again, when they're crossing, um, so stormwater cross uh, construction permits are the construction activities that occur on or near the bed of a river such that erosion uh, could be running into the river. And so that's a, a process for uh, making sure that we minimize any erosion that uh, uh, goes to the river and could impact water quality. And when they're on a outstanding or exceptional resource water, those get extra scrutiny. And again, that's one reason why they often uh, require uh, directional boring on these water bodies. Uh, so the goal of the construction site stormwater permit is to minimize that. There's something called a, uh, best management practices for stormwater management. They're required to put a plan together. And if they meet all the requirements, uh, they'll be issued this uh, general permit for the whole project. As Rob uh, stated earlier, these uh, permits don't have uh, public hearings or uh, public comment periods. Um, but there's no reason you can't uh, discuss stormwater management during the environmental review process. You could bring up issues at that time when the EIS is being reviewed. Um, so there's another permit that's often used on pipelines called a hydrostatic testing permit. So before they can use the pipeline, they have to uh, test it to make sure that it's not gonna leak, which is a good thing, and they typically uh, fill the pipeline with uh, water and then uh, uh, pressurize it uh, to expose any leaks. And uh, then after that process is done, they have to discharge that water. And so there's a, uh, what they call a WPDS permit, a pollution elimination discharge permit for those situations. And on um, general permits in general, it's kind of a checkbox. If you meet all the requirements, uh, you get conveyed uh, the permit. And like I said, there's a whole checklist that you have to go through. That covers most of the water permits. 
There might be an odd permit that we're not listing in the guide. Sometimes they need to withdraw water for, uh, a, you know, for dust suppression or something like that from uh, one of the streams along the route. And uh, there is a permit, a general permit for that. Um, these uh, withdrawal permits are typically not a whole lot of water. So it's uh, not too much of a problem to get those. And again, they're a general permit. But that's all I had, Rob. Thanks, Tom. I really uh, appreciate uh, using examples from their uh, permit application uh, to and on the Bad River. It's really an important water and watershed and to, sh and to show what they're uh, required to do or planning to do in there I think is really important example that, uh, uh, that puts us in a little bit of perspective for our viewers. So good job uh, on that. So uh, finally um, today before we get to our second uh, question and answer period, <clears throat> I'm just going to quickly um, overview the remaining uh, permits and approvals that are required for uh, pipeline uh, discussion. And, and in doing so, I will also indicate um, some uh, public input opportunities uh, for those. I'm just going to go and actually pull up here our uh, the guide that we developed for overall agency uh, permits uh, and approvals. And, you know, the first thing I would like to do is just kind of uh, indicate that um, there's really kind of three categories of public input, um, depending on the decision that is being made. And you can see here, we'll, um, those that are in green are when uh, public input is required uh, in a certain instance. Uh, those in gray are when um, public input may be required or, 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 or if it's optional or, or when it's required when triggered by a, a certain event, but is not always required in every instance. And then, and then finally in red, we have uh, down here, uh, let me show you when there is no public input opportunity. And just kind of build off of something that uh, Tom uh, was discussing and, and to clarify, when you have a general permit, there is a public input opportunity, but only when the general permit is issued. The problem is that general permits aren't issued uh, for a specific project. So the general permits that will govern um, certain aspects of the Line 5 reroute were issued well in advance of the, pro you know, even the proposal um, to, uh, to reroute the pipeline, let alone the submission of applications. And so, <clears throat> and the reason for this is that, that general permits are just that, they're general. They're issued for a general category of projects that have similar known impacts and that can be regulated using the same terms and conditions. So while there is a public input opportunity, when that general permit is issued, um, you're usually commenting on that in the abstract, um, unless you've compiled a bunch of data about <laughs> these category of projects that, you know, that, that you can show uh, while it should be changed a certain way. And so when it comes time for a project and it needs a general permit, it's not asking a general, for a general permit to be issued, it's asking to be covered under a general permit that's already been issued. And when that occurs, there is no uh, public input opportunity. I think Tom is very right when he points out though, that you can raise concerns with these um, uh, to DNR during the uh, environmental review process. And, and frankly, for that matter, you, uh, you can raise concerns with DNR um, about this, uh, about these general permits whenever you want. Um, the, the difference is, is that um, whether or not they're required to consider those permit or that, those comments, excuse me. So um, I just wanted to point that out um, and uh, just go back to the first page here. We've already talked about, um, I see you unmuting yourself, Tom. What's that? You have something I to add? I to say that the DNR has very limited ability to put conditions on a general permit. It's like I said, it's a checkbox. And uh, there's times at least in my career, what I would have dearly loved to put some conditions on it. The only thing we they could do is perhaps say it doesn't qualify and put it into an individual permit. And the, yeah, and that's exactly that's what, that's what I was going to build off of what you just said and say is yeah, if it doesn't check all of the boxes, um, you, you can 
or DNR can say that it needs to obtain an individual permit. There's also a certain procedure in some instances, particularly for the stormwater permitting, where you can petition the DNR to cover something under an individual permit. But you're, you, they don't just do it just because. You have to demonstrate why it doesn't qualify under the general permit and why it's more appropriately um, regulated under an individual permit. Uh, so yeah, thanks for chiming in and clarifying that, Tom. Um, so uh, as I said, we've already um, covered environmental review. We've covered eminent domain and, and condemnation to some extent, and, and Tom did a great job uh, on the wetland uh, and waterways uh, permit. So the other things I just want to overview here very quickly and identify the specific uh, public input opportunities is, of course, um, Pipeline companies are required to determine whether or not their activities um, may impact a uh, listed or, you know, endangered or threatened uh, species. Um, and uh, so during this, and like at the federal level, for example, um, the federal agencies are required to consult with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, you know, before taking any action. Um, and that, that endangered resource review also happens at the state level. If it is determined, um, that those activities will impact, uh, you know, a threatened or endangered species in an uh, inappropriate way, result in a take or harassment, uh, you know, displace them uh, in any way, um, they're required to obtain either from DNR or either from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service an incidental take permit. And so while there is no public input opportunity during the consultation, if an incidental take permit is required, uh, there is a, a public in, uh, input opportunity. And so you see that's why it's in gray, um, that, that public input opportunity is only triggered in this instance. At the federal level, you have 60 days to comment. At the state level, you have two weeks. Um, we've already been over uh, the general permitting. So the next thing we'll just discuss are these uh, other reviews of resource impact. So the uh, agricultural impact review is interesting. It is something that is uh, normally conducted by DACAP, but um, it's actually subsumed into the environmental review process when an EIS is going to be prepared. So uh, this is triggered when you know, an oil pipeline will involve the acquisition uh, of property interest in five or more acres of any farm operation. Um, but again, um, DATCAP is not under a duty to prepare an independent agricultural impact statement if an EIS will be prepared. What happens there is that DATCAP simply consults uh, with DNR um, during the EIS process and gives them the necessary information to include um, in, the AI, uh, in the EIS. And that is why your public input opportunity um, you know, in this instance, in instances where there's going to be an EIS is just happens during the environmental review process. Uh, the next thing we have here is a coastal uh, zone management review. And so when, when every uh, pipeline involves a federal permit, so here we have the US Army Corps of Engineers um, issuing uh, wetlands permits and in some instances waterway crossing permits. Anytime that happens, there's a federal permitting decision, the, the, the federal coastal zone uh, management act requires um, that agency um, to determine uh, whether or not uh, the, the project is consistent with the state's uh, coastal zone management program. And this is called federal consistency review. And that is actually administered by the Department of Administration. And so um, the, the, how it actually works is that the applicant uh, makes a federal consistency statement um, to DOA and then DOA analyzes whether or not uh, the project is going to be consistent with that. Um, and it's important to note that uh, the coastal zone, uh, as it were, is actually uh, in, uh, is in any county um, that borders, uh, you know, an ocean or a sea, or in this instance, a Great Lake. So in any county, we, we're going through uh, Ashland and Iron Counties with Line 5, it's bordering Lake Superior. Um, that is within the coastal zone and triggers this review. The public input opportunity, though, is there's not a separate one. It occurs in the permitting process that triggered the federal consistency review. So no independent uh, input opportunity there. Uh, finally, we have historic preservation consultation. Now, um, this actually requires uh, federal and state agencies, uh, because state agencies can uh, receive some amount of funding, 
um, to consider the impacts of their actions on historical uh, properties through consultation with state historic preservation officers, uh, often called SHPOs for short, and tribal historic uh, preservation officers, often called TIPOs. So, um, but even when um, there's not uh, like a federal um, a requirement to conduct this a consultation. State law still requires state agencies to engage uh, in that consultation. I think it's important to um, identify, you know, what actually constitutes uh, historical properties. And this is really interesting. You know, it's not just prehistoric and historic districts, sites, structures, or objects that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places, but it includes those that may be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, you know, in addition, um, other things that would be, uh, that need to be considered under this re review include things like artifacts and, and any of the records, burial sites and remains that uh, are related to and located within these historical properties, places of, you know, religious and cultural importance to tribes. And, um, you know, if it's concluded that the project won't impact any of these resources, that, that, that's essentially it through the, through the consultation. However, if it will impact uh, those resources, a lot of times pipeline companies just go around. Um, but that's not always possible or the case. And uh, if there, there still will be an adverse impact, they, they do have a, hold a public comment period um, on how to resolve those impacts. And that really kind of does it um, for that portion. Uh, Tom, do you have anything that you would add, want to add before we move to the final question and answer period? No. Good job. Okay, folks. Uh, there are a lot of questions that are very, very specific to this Line 5 project. And I'm going to try to put those off a little bit to the end and ask the more general questions about permitting and things along that line. And uh, I believe that the first one comes uh, from Mark, who probably asked this of Rob, or I guess, or perhaps Tom. Is there any established legal test anywhere within the United States, any one of the states, for balancing the public interest against individual rights? So um, this is one of those wonderful uh, instances where I say, I don't know. Um, I, that's a really good question. And I, I think something that I would be interested in researching further and, and maybe following up um, with Mark. Um, I think we probably have his uh, contact information. What, what I can say, just kind of broadly speaking, is that I do know um, that these sort of public interest tests do exist in other states uh, throughout, throughout the country. Uh, the, the problem is um, just kind of what was alluded to there is that they may be treated in different ways about what constitutes the public interest. They may be looking uh, and, and kind of what the interest that they're looking at may that may be advanced. And so it very well may be that there is some sort of balancing test that is looking at, you know, the rights of property owners, um, either individually or in general, uh, versus, you know, the, the benefits from from, uh, from the pipeline construction uh, it, that that very well may be the case and um, and I'm actually interested to find out so uh, we'll make note of that question and, I, and, I, and again I believe we have your uh, contact information and uh, we'll follow up with you we do uh, the next question comes from Joan uh, if the DNR hires a contractor before the scoping process. How do the contractors know exactly how much work they're bidding on? Tom, do you want to you want to take that one? I, I have I have an answer, but you may have a better one. I was wondering if Ron Grasshoff could chime in. <laughs> well, Ron's on. Well, um, oh, there he is. This is Ron. Can any can you hear me? Yes. Um, in my experience, uh, consultants uh, with experience in these kind of matters will uh, take that giant leap and say that they can take care of anything. Uh, they at times have to staff up to do that, but they're usually their first objective is to get the work. 
and if they can acquire the work with their uh, with their with their credentials, they're, they'll they'll oftentimes do presentations uh, when they're uh, working on trying to secure a contact uh, to demonstrate their expertise and their um, ability to conduct the work. And then if they are chosen, uh, that's when the process begins uh, as far as uh, uh, gearing up to get the work done. And like I said, uh, oftentimes they will subcontract uh, with other consultants uh, if they don't have the staff to do the work. Uh, Ron, correct me if I'm wrong too, is uh, I, I think everything gets billed, they work for DNR and they report to DNR, but everything gets billed to the company. And so they often use hourly weights for wetland delineations and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I think that that's true. I would, I would, I would say that's correct from my experience. Thanks for jumping in. Yeah. In, in addition, uh, they have the environmental impact report that's prepared by, you know, the oil pipeline company initially um, that identifies a lot of the issues um, and, and impacts of the project to go up. Off of. of course, that's not always exhaustive. Sometimes they have to, you know, prepare a supplemental EIR, which was very much the case in the in this Line Five reroute. Uh, but I, I, it does give them a good idea of, of what the work um, load is going to be, um, and they can take that uh, and put it in conjunction with their past experience and, and and make a pretty good estimate. Yeah, that's right. I think that's that's an excellent um, a summation um, because at least they have some baseline data, and they can then adjust uh, their proposal um, based on what at least what information's out there. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, let's move on to another question, and this one comes from Terry. Uh, will the current changes to federal wetland and stream and lake protection under the waters of the U.S. create gaps? where wetlands or seasonal water resources would be left out of the permit process? So um, uh, Nancy used to work for me way back when, and so I can still delegate to her. So Nancy, this is your question. <laughs> There's a short answer and that's yes. Um, yes, waters of the US rule could very well affect um, what the feds are able to do with permitting. And it's a little bit of an open question on how it's going to affect us as well. Um, we certainly have um, a wetlands law, which um, allows the state to look at uh, wetlands that would not be considered federal wetlands, um, but exactly how it might impact um, some of the other streams is a bit of an open question for us. So yes. Okay, thanks, Nancy. Uh, Tim, I wanted to add one more thing there. We're fortunate in Wisconsin that we have that backstop. A lot of states don't uh, have that. And so it is a, a good thing. And there have been attempts to change our wetland laws that Green Fire has fought very hard against precisely for this reason. Uh, so I, it's just something we have to keep an eye out for. Yeah, stay vigilant. A uh, question from Bobby, uh, which is really relevant to what's going on in uh, the world of oil production today. And that has to do if uh, a company determines that it's no longer profitable to transport oil through a pipeline that they've been constructing, what happens to that pipeline when it becomes abandoned? Does it just stay in place? Does it have to be picked up, thrust out in place? Yeah, I think that's a it's a really interesting question and one that may play out um, the you know market conditions notwithstanding, right? The the whole idea of the reroute is that they are going to abandon the 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 pipeline um, that is currently going through the Bad River Reservation. A lot of the times, the uh, the pipeline will make the argument. Uh, that uh, it is more damaging to the environment to go in and then rip out the pipeline again um, uh, and, and kind of try to restore that back to its original condition instead of just abandoning it and leaving it in place. Uh, my understanding um, is that with regards to the Bad River Reservation uh, itself, that some of those easements actually requires uh, 
Enbridge to go in and remove the pipe uh, if if the easements aren't re renewed. Uh, again, that's just my understanding. I haven't read the, the easements themselves, but and so that that is hearsay. But and so um, could they be required to do so? Perhaps um, I think uh, you know I do think it could. Uh, you're you are just incurring some of those environmental impacts all over again, right? You're having to bring machinery in to dig the holes, you're disturbing the ground, there can be an erosion and runoff and, and all of those things. And, um, and so it is a, a decision that would have to, to be made, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. All right, uh, Jen has asked a couple questions regarding uh, the streams that have been proposed for crossing. And that is, uh, who verifies that those streams listed are actually listed correctly uh, by their their use or their their character, I guess. And uh, so, why don't you just ask that one person? And there's a follow up. Uh, so I'll start, Nancy. You can fill in. Uh, but uh, you know, the department has water resources staff that go out and monitor these streams. We try to get into the streams on like a 10 year cycle at least to verify we have them classified properly and at the appropriate uh, quality. Um, to me, this is somewhere where the public could provide instant, uh, information. For example, if they had something that wasn't classified as an exceptional resource source water and you were catching trout in it, that would be information that would change the status of that stream and be information that would be helpful. Nancy? Yeah, I would agree. And I think that photographs that show depth would be important as well. And that could be uh, good information to submit. Uh, but I think the basis of the question is, does the DNR accept the information that is provided at base value? And the question is, the answer is not completely, not entirely. Um, in, in, point of fact there probably isn't the staffing level level required to ground truth everything but no what is submitted is not necessarily accepted as complete information uh, mary jo has asked a question regarding withdrawal of water from the watershed if it if a pipeline process withdraws water from that watershed uh, since the reroute is all within the Lake Superior Basin, wouldn't withdrawal be prohibited through the Great Lakes Compact? Uh, no, it, no, it wouldn't be. Um, so the Great Lakes Compact uh, it does regulate uh, withdrawals uh, from the the Great from the Great Lakes themselves. And, and what I mean by that is you put a pipe in the Great Lakes and from the surface water and and pump it out of there. And if that were the instance, which I don't think it is in the case of line five, that would um, require them to obtain some sort of water use permit. Um, generally when it's a low amount, that's a temporary water use permit. I think um, uh, Tom alluded to that earlier. If it were a very significant amount, you know, say over 5 million gallons per day over a 90 day period, that that's a huge withdrawal and that's going to trigger a review by the compact council um, and all, you know, all of the states that border the Great Lakes, but, but that is absolutely not the case here. And, um, but if that were the case, they would be uh, required to return that water to, to the Great Lakes Basin. Um, but here, my, my understanding is that they're going to be getting uh, some of this water from the groundwater and that it is not at such a high volume um, and over it's not only that it's, it's the volume, it's the volume over a period of time that really triggers a lot of the permitting requirements. And my understanding is that it's not high enough to uh, trigger those. And, and in practice, um, when we've worked with uh, permitting for hydrostatic testing, you know, we've been very concerned about movement of water between watersheds. So that's something that we do pay attention to. I'm saying we as in my former life in DNR. All right, uh, Mary Jo has asked another rather general question because there are other pipelines other than line five traversing Wisconsin. Uh, so she's asked, have any Wisconsin counties developed ordinances to protect its local resources or services such as roads or transportation? Uh, and is there an ordinance 
that Ashland County should consider? So local governments absolutely have the ability to require things like road use permits. Uh, when a uh, pipeline is constructed, that, that oftentimes requires heavy machinery being brought in to accomplish those things, to bore, to dig trenches, um, all, all of those things. And uh, that repeated use on roads can, can definitely have an impact. You know, in addition to that, you also have to maintain the pipeline and do inspection digs and, and things like that. So there's also, a, you know, a continued use um, on roads. And so um, local governments do have the ability to um, require things like a road use agreement that would require, um, you know, initial assessment of the road conditions and then to demonstrate that it's actually Enbridge's activities that have caused damage to the roads and, and may require them to, uh, Re, uh, to resurface or, you know, or reconstruct the, those roads. Um, now that's just in, in regards to roads specifically. And I think that that's a really good example of things that a local government actually can do. There are absolutely things that governments uh, cannot do. And, um, and that is actually when they attempt to regulate um, safety related to pipelines. That, that's expressly preempted under the Federal Pipeline uh, Safety Act, and it's something that is overseen um, by uh, the, what is that, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, I believe, PHMSA. Um, Tom, do you have anything to add? I was just going to say a, a local government guide is something we're considering uh, constructing as part of this arrangement, so. This is Ron uh, Grassoff. Uh, can I just uh, summarize an action that G Dane County uh, try attempted to carry out with Enbridge? Go ahead, Ron. Um, yeah, um, Enbridge was um, planning to install a, uh, a pumping station on one of it on its north-south line that eventually goes into sh to Chicago to the refineries. And Dane County, I believe, passed an ordinance uh, requiring um, liability insurance for potential spills or, or accidents that was over extensively over and above the standard liability uh, that's required. And uh, the case went to court, and I believe that they, they were overruled and they, uh, the ordinance could not uh, apply to that project. That's right. Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, and it was uh, them requiring try, uh, trying to do that and it uh, ended up, I believe, in a legislative end run and the legislature passing le uh, a law that sp specifically prohibited the local governments from uh, requiring anything more stringent than established under state law. And I believe part of that case also had to do with the type of demonstration the pipeline company had to make uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the exact nature of, of its liability insurance. Um, and so, um, but you're absolutely right, they, they were overruled there. Um, and that, that just has to do with, um, with the, 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 its relationship to state law. Okay, uh, Kathy has uh, pointed out that the Superior River Watershed Association is seeking funding to monitor waters within the pipeline construction area. And she's wondering whether or not there might be sources of funding to support that work. Uh, and if there's anything that county should enact to protect them themselves in case of pipeline, pipeline harm or in case of a spill. Um, that's a that's a good question. I I honestly um, don't know about like the the funding uh, source aspect of the of the question. I think um, there are absolutely sources of funding to to accomplish those sorts of things, but I um, struggle to uh, point any of those out directly. Nancy or Tom, do you have an answer to that question? The DNR does operate a grant program that river groups can qualify for and quite often do apply for in these situations. And, uh, you know, I, I would think because this project is coming forward and it's probably been, as Nancy pointed out, a number of years since we've been into some of those watersheds, we'd, uh, I'd say we as in former life again, but I would think the DNR would have an interest in uh, funding something along those lines. 
Yeah, I agree with that, Kathy, and otherwise um, maybe approaching some foundations. Okay. Now, there, what's that, Jim? Go ahead, Rob. Well, I was going to the second half of the question, um, if I remember or what it was exactly, was uh, was just kind of a broad question. If there's anything that the county do can do to protect uh, itself from, from the pipeline construction? That's correct. Yeah, there, there, there are... Uh, things that the uh, local governments, uh, including counties in Wisconsin, can do. I mean, it's just a question of what is the purpose and uh, goal of uh, those uh, ordinances or laws, and uh, particularly in reference to the Federal Pipeline Safety Act. They cannot, the, the primary purpose of the law can't be geared towards public safety. That doesn't mean they can't uh, Ron mentioned a, a, a pumping station, uh, for, for example. A lot of times pumping stations are, well, almost all the time are above ground, right? And so a local government could actually require a setback based on aesthetics, um, you know, for, uh, for that. As far as the spill response and thing, things like that go, there, there may be some very nuanced things that a county can do, but generally that's also gonna be left to the federal government because it, it's, it's geared towards safety. Um, and, you know, and again, there may be other things um, that, uh, that aren't preempted by the Pipeline Safety Act that local governments can do, but that may be preempted under state law. And so um, I think Tom alluded to the fact that we, uh, we are preparing a local government guide and we'll address some of these uh, issues a little bit more specifically, but it is not as though local governments are totally locked out of pipeline regulation. Okay, uh, there are a few additional questions that we won't really have time to answer, but I want to let everybody know that they're recorded and we'll review them and uh, get back to you if anybody has anything to add. I'm sorry that we couldn't get any more specific about boring and things like that. Uh, but right now, I think I need to turn this back over to Fred uh, to wrap it up because we are coming on to the witching hour. So go ahead, Fred. Coming into the, uh, the Miller hour. Thank you, Jim. And we wanna thank all of our uh, panelists today. Um, Rob and Nancy and Tom for just an excellent program that um, we've certainly all learned a lot from. So uh, as Jim said, there is more to learn and I'm gonna to try to share my last slide here. Um, for those of you that uh, had questions that you weren't able to answer, we will try to follow up uh, with folks as we are able to. And I wanna also just again, on behalf of all of us, thanks to Nancy Larson, Tom Giroux and Rob Lee for a really informative program. We are continuing work on these issues. And as Nancy described, there is more work in the pipeline, um, on the pipeline. We're interested in your feedback on, on where to take this project, as well as um, interested in your ideas about support for the project. So um, we hope to continue a conversation with all of you about that. Um, finally, we want to uh, call your attention to the next um, webinar in our program one week from tonight, and that is our virtual field trip with John Bates. Uh, John's program is titled Our Living Ancestors, and it is the uh, his experience uh, walking through uh, the old growth forest of Wisconsin. John's a, a remarkable uh, work as a naturalist and from the comfort of our living rooms, we will all learn a lot with him uh, visiting some of Wisconsin's greatest forest resources. So we're excited about that. We invite you to join us for that, as well as to other programs, other future webinar programs that we'll be announcing shortly. Um, You'll be getting a survey uh, or an invitation to complete a survey in the mail tomorrow. We, we hope that you'll take a minute to let us know how we did uh, tonight. And again, share with us your ideas about future programs. The, the real, the mission of these webinars is to showcase the work of our Wisconsin Green Fire members as well as our partners. And I think we uh, showed the ability and the value of doing that tonight. So on behalf of all of us at Wisconsin's Green Fire, we wanna thank you for participating. Uh, we hope to see you next time and we hope to see you as well as online 
Uh, we hope to see all of you out in the field someday soon. Thanks everyone. Take care and all the best.